For all those of you that have been struggling at work, maybe you've been taken for granted or whatever, your job is just tough. Maybe you're having a rough time with the authorities in your life. Well, I want to tell you something. The parable of the slave at duty is going to be for you. Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to our Bible study. We are still in the Beatitudes, and today is going to be amazing. But first of all, let me welcome everybody watching us live this morning. Uh, those may be watching us later by our websites. Welcome into our Bible study. Good morning, Crosswalk Church. You got all these smiling faces. It is Palm Sunday. Next week is Easter. Can you believe that it's Easter already? So we're going to be celebrating Easter uh, outdoors at one of our uh, members, Miss Violet's home next week, and it's going to be awesome. Today, we're going to be looking at one of my favorite passages in the entire Bible. I love this passage. Uh, early uh, in our ministry, Lisa and I were at one of the uh, Assemblies of God uh, district councils. I think we may have been in Shreveport at the time. And it was the night that they were honoring missionaries, missionaries that were coming off the field. They were retiring. They had done their part, and they were changing the season in their life. And I can remember there was this one couple. They were in their upper 80s, and they had been in the field a long, long time. And I remember the, <clears throat> the missionary getting up, and he was talking about uh, all the things that they had done, but he didn't talk long. He goes, one of the things that I want to tell you the most, and he read the verse out of this parable, and that verse was, we are unprofitable servants. He goes, all the work we did, we did for the glory of God, and we were all unprofitable servants. And that really, really stuck with me. I really, 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 really was impacted by that. And I remember looking over at my wife. We were young. I said, boy, I, you know, when we're older and we get to that age, you know, uh, you know, I'm hoping that we have that kind of love for God and and uh, the the fervor that we've always had. And uh, it's just amazing. Let me give you the verse this morning. Let me give you my text. And it's found in Luke. Let me get kind of adjusted here. Sorry, we got started a little bit late. We had a, a malfunction in one of the mics, but we're good to go right now. Thank you, Sarah, for being here today. Things always go smoother when Sarah is here, and we always love that. Look at Luke 17. Oh, by the way, let me say this. It was so good to have my daughter, Alyssa, and my uh, son-in-law, Angel, here this past week. We had a good time. We did a lot of things. And they're nestled back in New York, getting ready to get back in their uh, routine of work and all the things they do. Today, let's look at Luke 17, verses 7 through 10. By which of you have any servant plowing or feeding cattle will say unto him by and by, when he has come in from the field, go and sit down to meet, and will not rather say unto him, make ready wherewith I may sup and gird thyself and serve me till I have eaten and drunken, and afterwards thou shalt eat and drink. Doth he think, does he thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded of him? I trow not, he said, no. So likewise, ye, when ye shall have done all of these things which are commanded you, say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done that which was our duty to do. What a great, great uh, parable today we're going to be looking at. This is what I call a non-Phariseeism parable. Phariseeism is, you know, that religious attitude that's real selfish and uh, is not a real good example of how to live for Christ. Well, this is the opposite of that, and it's about slaves or servants. Now, uh, how many of y'all had kids? You may be watching today, you have kids, and you give your children a duty. Okay, today you're going to wash dishes, you're going to cut the grass, you're going to, you know, sweep and mop or whatever. And they look at you and they go, what are we, your servant? You treat us like a slave. Well, if they ever say that to you, then you need to take them to this verse. When your kids ask you if they are your slaves, look at Ephesians 6, 5. Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters. 
according to the flesh, with fear and trembling and the singleness of heart as unto God. Yeah, you're my servant. You're my slave. You're going to do this. Now, we don't treat our kids that, but listen, I believe that one of the problems that we're seeing in our world today is that kids weren't given responsibilities. Uh, we had a work day. Actually, we had a work week when I was coaching tennis at Ridgeview, and I could really tell the level of the players. And uh, there were, you know, quite a few players out there. And we were resurfacing. We were filling in cracks and things, whatever, on the court. And I remember there were two of these players. Maybe they were a little bit older. But they went out there, and they just grabbed things, and they just started working. I didn't have to, you know, look over them. They just went at it. Then there was like eight of them that were laying around. I'm like, get up and get over here and do this and do this. So you know what? The two that really worked had good work ethics. One of the things I really instilled in my kids was you need to have a good work ethic. Whatever you do, do it. Do it right. Do it the best you can. No matter what, no matter what job you're at, you do it. And so <clears throat> I think today in our families, let me just talk to you for a moment as a parent. I think your children need to have chores. I think they need to do those things. I think the time has come when you need to stop just opening that wallet and flipping out money to your children and they're not doing anything. They're laying around, they're watching TV, they're playing games. They don't do anything. Listen, we need to instill that work ethic back into our children in the church today. If we don't, they're going to grow up to be, uh, you know, adults that want things given to them. I'm going to talk about that in just a minute. I don't want to jump ahead. Let's talk about this parable today. We're going to break it down a little bit. Let's look at the cast. So we know that the cast is broken down into two players, the listeners, which are the servants. That's us. Everybody say, I'm a servant of Christ Jesus. Our master is God. Everybody say, I'm glad I'm serving God. Everybody, come on this morning. It is such a pleasure to serve the Lord. Come on, say it out there. Do y'all believe that today? Do y'all really believe that today? And I'm going to tell you something. Here's the key. If those things fit you today, if you feel like life has been unfair, you've been taken for granted, your boss is using and abusing you, this is going to change your life. I preached a similar sermon when I was in Birmingham, and we had gone out to eat. It's been a couple of weeks since I preached it. <clears throat> I had the pleasure, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> a little bit of drainage this morning. I had the pleasure to... Uh, fill in for our senior pastor when he was out of town. And uh, a couple weeks later, we went out to eat after church, and we were at a steakhouse, a restaurant. And the waitress came up to me, and she went to our church, and she goes, Pastor Armand, I just want to tell you, I had a really big problem at work. I hated my job. I hated my boss. I hated what I did. She goes, you preached a message a couple weeks ago about serving God. And I took that to heart and began to change my attitude. And she, knows, she says, you know what? My whole work system changed around me. I began to enjoy my job. I began to like my employer. I began to work hard. And I've already got a raise, and it's only been a couple of weeks. So what I'm about to tell you is amazing. You need to understand because it's the Word of God. Somebody say amen. So we know what the cast is. Good morning. we got people coming in this morning. How are you all today? <clears throat> Man, pollen. So today we're going to look at this. Uh, the plot the role of a servant serving their master. Uh, we'll break this down a little bit. So that's the plot. Now, let's look at the conflict here. What in the world is the conflict? Well, Jesus is presenting the unthinkable action of a servant breaching duties to serve themselves. Now, remember, the customs and times of this day was you worked. You didn't work. You didn't, you didn't eat. And they were brought up. The Jews were brought up. The young men were brought up in the... Uh, the career or the job of the father. And the young women were brought up in, in the home. And so we see that this is a functional society. Everybody did their part. Somebody say amen. Something we're having a breakdown in society today. Not everybody's doing their part. And I'll get to that. This parable will conflict with the carnal nature of man. Now, before I was saved, I had a problem with people telling me what to do. I had a problem with authorities telling me what to do. Come on, somebody say amen and ask. Before you're saved, your carnal nature is you don't want somebody telling you what to do. 
You don't want people correcting you. So if you're in, if you're a believer today and you're jumping around from church to church because somebody in authority is holding you accountable and you get offended and you get angry at them and you leave and you go to another church and you say, that church hurt me. Well, and they were correcting you and you needed to be corrected. Listen, you're only fooling yourself. That needs to stop. Come on, church. Listen, those that are watching today, you need to find a church that God has called you to. You need to uh, plant yourself in that church no matter what. There is no perfect church. You'll never find a perfect pastor. Come on, somebody say amen. But you're not there for them. You're there to serve God and to help them. What? You mean I don't go to church for them to come wait on me and whatever, whatever. Now listen, if you wait on others, as a, what's a servant do? What does it say? It, it's, a, it's all about a mindset. That mindset is we need to put other people first. Our society is saying you need to be first and you need to buck the system when you're not. I'm going to tell you why that's not right as we go on here. That's the conflict. Let me give you the resolution. I'm sorry about all the side preaching, but I'm getting excited about this today. Listen, Jesus admonishes the servants to do their due diligent selflessly. When you're serving your master, and this is it, the natural man, you that are servants, you that work, you may be a, a bond slave. We'll talk about that in a minute. Do everything you can for your master. Do everything they say according to the will of God, and your life is going to be blessed. Remember what blessed means. Better, well off, prosperous. Blessed are they. We'll get to that as it goes on. So uh, in the Beatitudes, I do the Beatitudes and parables when I study, and they're so close together, and sometimes they run together. Sometimes I'm back and forth on it, so... Uh, the Beatitudes today is going to be talking about this. You need to join in about 1130-ish and, uh, and check that out. So this uh, parable is going to conflict with human nature. Well, here's the resolution. The resolution is this. Jesus is, admonishes the servants to do their due diligence. So it's reminiscent of the two sons. One didn't do the work, the other one did. So we're seeing that the parables are kind of talking a little bit about each other. Now, Jesus is talking about this. He's talking about bond servants. Now, this is really good. I'm going to give you something cool here. The word is doulos. And uh, the New Testament bond servant could refer to someone who voluntarily serves others. However, in most cases, it refers to a person in permanent service. They're getting paid to work for a master. Either they're working off a debt or they're getting paid for it. The children, the youth that are here today, when you're at home, you're doing your chores because you love your mom and dad. They got silent in the youth section this morning. Mom and dad are going to love this one. You do. You are there to help them. Listen, when, when you're living at home, man, you don't have rent, you don't have anything, you just float. And that's not a bad thing. But on the other hand, I think that Children should have a responsibility. You should have a responsibility in a home. I'm not going to go over that all uh, over again. But listen, they were considered property to a Roman citizen. They had <clears throat> holding uh, no right to leave their place of service. Uh, Jesus was referring to bond servants of God. So look at uh, uh, 2 Peter here in a second. Where are you? Where did you go? There we are. Paul calls himself a bondservant. James and Jude and uh, the half-brother of Jesus and Peter all refer to themselves as a servant or a bondservant. Look at 2 Peter. Simon Peter, a what? A servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ to them that have obtained like precious face with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Paul said it up. Paul, a servant. James, a bond servant. These were the men that Jesus walked with. They were the select elect. And they were saying, we are just mere slaves to God. 
So that should teach us something today. Listen, senior pastors are there to serve. They're there to feed the flock. They're there to, to help. I'll get into some more things in a minute. Jesus is going to ask three questions. Here they are. He's going to ask three questions in this passage. But which one of you, so this is going to pull the listeners in. This is the one that's going to get them. He opens with a hypothetical question saying, uh, one that's going to grab their attention. And what you got to understand is these, these disciples were not masters. They were not homeowners. They were not landowners. They themselves identified with a servant. They knew what a servant was. They understood what it was to work for someone else. So he's saying, which one of you? So Jesus is given this question, and it is one of those that's going to shock them because they would never do what Jesus is going to throw out to them. So question number two is this, and would rather not. So the slave's duties do not end at the doorway in this situation. They go much further. So here's the thing. Only when the, <clears throat> the duties of the slave are completed can they settle in and eat themselves. So here's what's going on. It's a small farm. It has one master, one slave. The, the slave, the bond servant, was required to work outside and inside for this master. And then the master paid them. He took care of them. So you need to get this in your mind. So, uh, and the third question he's going to ask is this. He says, when he comes in and he does all this, does he go and wait for the master to go, oh, you did so good, pat you on the back, you know, I love you so much, come and hang out with me. No. He doesn't do that. The servant doesn't expect the master to do anything other than what the terms were for him to repay his whatever he's doing. So we need to understand everything Jesus is saying. He goes, are they going to uh, go? Is, is the slave going to come in from the field and go eat before the master? And the, the answer to that is what? A resounding no, they wouldn't do that. So he's got their attention and they're listening and under, understanding. So the word unprofitable here is this. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's an expression of modesty. Unworthy of receiving some reward for service. Look at Job 22, 2 and 3. Can a man be profitable unto God as he that is wise may be profitable unto himself? He said, no, you know, God doesn't owe us anything. Is it any pleasure to the Almighty that thou art righteous? Or is the gain to him that thou makest thy ways perfect? So in other words, he said, we're unprofitable. It's, it's a modesty thing. I work for my master and I don't expect anything other than what he gives me, a roof over my head, food on my table, maybe some money. But I don't expect him to go, oh, man, you did so great today. That's the problem with a lot of people. People don't want to work until they have recognition. Oh, if you give me recognition, I'll work hard, whatever, whatever. But the problem with that is they can never get enough recognition. Somebody say amen. So people get their feelings hurt in church because you know, the pastors didn't say or recognize something. Uh, you know, they, they did this thing and they were like, oh, let me just tell you, <clears throat> here's some truth. And this is a true story. When I was at, uh, when I was in uh, Birmingham, the cathedral, it was a mega church. We had like 6,000 people there. And I was Pastor Mark's senior associate. And I helped him with a lot of things. And there were so many times, that, now he moved like a million miles an hour. We were talking about this the other day when I was over there. He was like, man, you know, we did some really crazy things. It was just unbelievable. You know, he would come in on a Wednesday and he would do a Wednesday night study and he would go, well, I need to make a book. This is a 20 page book and it needs to be laid out like this. I need you to design it and print it and bind it and have it ready for tonight. It's a good thing I had a lot of staff working with me, under me and helping me to get this. We had a good team. But there were times when he would give me an assignment. Now, listen, all you guys out there that are, are not senior pastors, and you may be watching this, if you're a senior pastor, you might want to show your staff this video. I'm a senior pastor now, so I get it. But when you're on staff, it doesn't matter what that senior pastor needs you to do. You need to do it. 
If he comes in and says, Bob, I need you to wash my car today, and you're looking at your little resume going, wait a minute, that's not, that's not on my job description, rather. I don't wash cars. I preach when you're not here, or I lead worship. Now, listen, if you're a staff pastor today or a, a, a subordinate to another pastor, you need to do what they tell you to do. And you don't need to gripe about it. You don't need to complain about it. Come on, can I get a witness in the house today? There were days when Pastor Mark would give me something to do that I would do it. And he would nix it at the last minute. And I just worked five hours on something that he just nixed. But the Holy Spirit taught me, listen, you're there to serve him. If he wants to nix it, it's because God told him to nix it. So you're just there to serve, to get the word out. The bottom line is we are left here after salvation to work the work of God, and God gives us the church to work it through. God gives you the church today to serve so that you can see the gospel expanded. Somebody say amen. So we need to get off this little pedestal. You know, man, I just, I don't like this. I'm just telling you right now, I, I don't like pastors that, that, you know, you're hired for one specific thing and that's all you do. You know, I've seen pastors come and go with cathedral and some of them that were worship leaders. All they wanted to do is go sit in the sanctuary every day and, and, and just play music. When there were hospital visits that needed to be made, there were programs that needed to be run, people that needed to be seen, things that needed to be done. But no, they were caught up in their own little world. That was bad. I did not like that. I'm going to tell you, as a senior associate, I was having to get these guys mobilized. And uh, I want you to understand, we are there to serve our authorities. Who's the ultimate authority? I see hands going like this. God is the ultimate authority. So here it is. Jesus is instructing the disciples and the church that their service does not entitle them to anything. Okay, disclaimer. Everybody say, okay, disclaimer. This is a big one. I want you to understand what I'm about to say is going to offend some people. But you know what? Too bad. I'm going to say it anyway. Let's talk about this today. Let's talk about, well, if I turn this thing around, here's my big statement. Get ready. Some of you don't turn me off yet. Entitlement is not of God. Oh, boy, I can hear it now. Oh, no, 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 no. There's injustice going on. They're entitled to this. And that. Nobody in this, on this planet is entitled to anything. The children that are in your family aren't entitled for you to go out and buy them a car when they're 16. That's not how it works. They're not entitled to those things. When we work hard, we're not entitled to our boss giving us special attention or a special bonus. Now, if they want to, that's one thing. No one on this planet in any day or age is entitled to anything. It is unscriptural. Can I get a big amen? So here's a little bit of a, of a, 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 a article I found. Here's why. Entitlement is the belief that one is inherently deserving of privileges or special treatment. And this article I found was real good. I'm, I'm just going to quote the four things that it says here. Number one, entitlement is a denial of truth. We don't live in truth today in our society. Everybody wants to believe what somebody tells them, even though it isn't truth. Come on. Somebody say amen. Only the Word of God is truth. If you're basing how you live on society or other people, you're going to miss God. Now, let me just read out the rest of this on this. If we get to where we really think we deserve something and what you need to understand is, do y'all really know what we deserve? In reality, yes, thank you. What we really deserve is hell. Because once again, we're looking at a social environment today. We're looking at how man treats man. What we need to get back to is the Word of God. What we need to look at is what's going to happen in eternity and quit looking at all the selfishness 
that's going on in the world. So it is a denial of the truth. Listen, we deserve hell. We don't deserve anything. It's by God's grace and mercy that we have anything. Now, don't get me wrong. I believe in social programs for poor. Jesus instituted that. He said it. And we understand that. I'm just saying nobody is entitled to anything when you look at the reality of things in eternity. Can I get amen? So the payment we deserve for our sin is death. For we were offensive against a holy God. Second thing, entitlement is destructive in that it robs us of gratitude. Here we go. We live with a sense of entitlement. When we do, it's impossible for us to also live with a sense of gratitude because we're always expecting more. Have you ever noticed, people, the more you give them, the more they want? When you give a lot of free stuff, they want more. What you gave them isn't enough. So it's destructive to gratitude. I want to be thankful for what I get. I want to be thankful for what God's doing for me. Let me give you the next ones real quick. Entitlement destroys relationships. The Bible says to rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. But for a person of entitlement, these two things are very hard to do. It's hard to rejoice with someone when you're comparing what you have to what they have because inevitably you will drift into the belief that you ought to have or do what they do. And here's the difference. You have somebody that's worked hard. They were wise with their money. They were wise with uh, what they're doing. Then you have somebody that was slacking and just, you know, getting by. Nobody made them do anything. They're unmotivated. And you see someone with a good job making good money, you know, having nice things. And then they want those things that they didn't earn. Listen, it destroys relationships. Well, I don't want to hang around with Harrison. He's driving that new Corvette now. And it's a pretty color. I like it. But I can't be his friend because I, I deserve that. I'm entitled to have that. You need to give that to me. You got like five kids are going, uh-uh. Harrison doesn't have a, a new vet. But what I'm saying is it hurts relationships. Let me give you the last one. Entitlement is destructive because it ultimately puts us in the place of God. We're saying, I know better than God on what God needs to do. And that's why entitlement is so bad. So let me give you the bottom line. The bottom line of this is this, and we need to get this. If we don't get this today, then we're going to always have a problem. We are not worthy of God's praise or his rewards. Listen, we are sinners. We are unholy. Every one of us, every person ever born is unholy. God owes us nothing. But the Bible says that God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son to die for us. It was mercy and it was grace that God, listen, we can't sit there and go, God, you owe me this. I did this and I did that for you. So you owe me this. Listen, right now there's somebody watching. You've done some things and you sacrificed and, and it, your answers uh of prayer weren't what you thought they should be. So you got angry with God because God didn't hold his end of the bargain. Now, when I was in school at Southwestern, I remember one time I was like, man, you know what? I really need a blessing and I just gotten paid. So I took my $20 that I had, my extra 20 bucks. And I said, I'm going to put this in the offering and I'm going to believe God for $200. I'm investing 20 for 200. So I gave that in the offering, and guess what? No, the $200, <laughs> it did not come. But God did bless me in other ways. Listen, God is not on your time frame. God is not in your top 10 list to check off. God is God. He's sovereign. He does what He wants, when He wants, for whom He wants. But it doesn't mean that we shouldn't serve Him or give to Him as His Spirit leads us. Somebody say amen. Come on. The one who loves God and seeks to do his will knows that one's duty is never done. Look at this verse here in Mark. And he sat down and he called the twelve and saith unto them, If any man desires to be first, the same shall be last of all and servant of 
Oh, one of the, I, I, I taught in a college, we had a college there in Birmingham. And one of the things I would always tell those that are attending to be leaders and become pastors or whatever, we would send them out in, into uh, church plants. One of the things that we did I really liked about in Birmingham, we were a really big church and we had, we had, all, we had everything. I mean, there was nothing that we could not do. But in our college, we were training young men and women and some that were older that had kind of missed God early in life. And we were training them the proper way to be a pastor and to lead people. And the biggest way to lead people is to serve people. I was talking to, once again, to my senior pastor. I spent some time with him a uh, week before last, and we were sitting there and we were talking about all kinds of things. He said, yeah, I know a pastor that, uh, I forgot where it was. He goes, He's, he has several services on Sunday, and when the uh, 8 o'clock service is done, all of the uh, worship leaders in the worship team would go and clean the bathrooms and set up the host area. You couldn't be on the team if you didn't do that. Now, a lot of people are going, man, that's terrible to make people do that kind of stuff. Listen, God has blessed them with a voice. Let them use that to sing. But this pastor had it right, y'all. I'm telling you, we need to learn to serve. Somebody say amen. In fact, when we were in Birmingham, one of the things that Pastor Mark did, he came in, he took pastor off of everything, and he put servant on it. His office in his parking spot said senior servant. Mine was servant. Everybody else was servant, 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 servant. Because that's what we were. We were servants. We were teaching people to be servants so they could lead. Somebody say amen. Let me bring this on down. The parable is an instruction for the disciples to do all that is commanded. Ah, page stuck. Of them with joy under the Lord. So what motivates us to keep serving God? Well, this is what it is. Anybody want to know? Since we're not getting accolades and we're not getting all these extra bonuses, you know, God blesses us for being faithful here in this life, but we don't expect it. We don't say, well, I'm going to do this so God will do this. What motivates us? Well, it's something beyond today. Because a lot of people want their award reward today. They want acknowledgement of today. They want, uh, you know, accolades today. Let me just tell you what Jesus says about this in Matthew, and I'll close in Matthew 6, 1 through 2. Take heed that you do not your alms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise, you have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee as the hypocrite do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have the glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. In other words, when you toot your own horn, you got to show what you're doing. You're, you know, you're parading what you've done. You're publishing. Oh man, I've done all these great things for God. God say, well, people look at that and they go, oh man, they're awesome. Well, they got their reward. How many of you want your reward now, or do you want your reward later? Let's talk about reward here, and that's it. <clears throat> Let me read this last story to you. In ancient races, athletes are not rewarded right below the stadium, but they're called up to the stage for reward. In our earthly race, we are rarely rewarded on earth, but in heaven, we're going to be elevated to a reward. How good is this? Bottom, the whole thing is this. Listen, wherever you work, whatever you're doing, you do for that boss with all you got. You care about what you're doing. You care about the product you're selling or whatever you're doing there. You do it like you're serving God. And listen, when your attitude changes, everything around you will change. Somebody say amen. Well, thank you for joining us today. We're going to continue next week. On our, uh, no, actually, next week we have Easter. We'll be doing outdoor service. We may try to uh, podcast that from a camera or iPhone. But uh, anyway, the next week we'll be back on with the parables. Don't forget, at 11.30, we're going to be doing the Beatitudes today. Kind of dovetails with this. Everybody in my church knows that usually first and second service, they kind of run into each other and overlap each other. We know that the Holy Spirit is in that. So until next week, we pray that God will bless you and hope that you will join us.